So meanwhile, and we have um, we have uh, sound basically. I mean, mostly about um, about the the really relentless project that the right seems to have when it comes to uh, pushing back on high school students. I mean, it is both amazing to see students get this involved in politics on such a um, intense level and as inspiring as i think all of us find it apparently the right wing finds it terrifying ben shapiro seems to have dedicated his entire online presence to um making the case that david hoag one of the students from from parkland has no right to be talking about about guns here is uh, Ben Shapiro's, and and I, for the life of me, I can't quite figure out. I mean, because uh, Ben spends about four minutes of his 10-minute clip talking about how he is going to disassemble the, each factual in, uh, mistake that uh, David Hoga, and it ends up being just a like a media critique of uh, the way that he's approached. So in that vein, let me just start by saying that in the early 90s, MTV developed a style of shooting which at the time seemed interesting, but it was incredibly annoying. And that is, I'm shooting and I'm talking direct to camera. And what MTV is going to do is like, we're going to put another camera in the room that's going to make it look like we're a fly on the wall. So we're going to see somebody talk to camera, but they're not going to be talking to our camera. And for some reason, Ben Shapiro has dug deep into the old, old, old playbook of stuff that used to be interesting 25 years ago and actually was always annoying. And half of this is him staring into something that is not the camera. So I would just say, if as long as we're on media critique, that would be my media critique of, uh, of Ben Shapiro. Or, or you just, I don't know what it is. I mean, we do a radio show here, so we don't always talk into camera. But I'm not going to set up another camera over here to watch me talk into this camera. Ben Shapiro does. But watch this. It's sort of fascinating because they really, really are scared of this. And do we have the front part where Shapiro in teasing? Okay. well, so Ben Shapiro is talking about how, again, just because you're a victim of a shooting does not make you an expert on. I guess, gun control, which, you know, I'm not even sure if that's accurate because um, one of the main reasons why you might want to have gun control is that you realize the horror that guns cause. And if you've been a victim of that, your level of understanding of that is, in many respects, unrivaled. So maybe the exact policy prescriptions that these students are calling for um, shouldn't be just taken wholesale. But the idea of more gun control and less guns, I think you couldn't be better situated than to have been part of a mass shooting event to be an expert on why we might need that. But in his windup of talking about facts that he was going to deliver, he just sort of casually said, uh, just because uh, George Soros was a collaborator during the Nazis doesn't mean that I'm going to take his political opinions. Like George Soros went through the Holocaust, right? He was a guy who ended up having to help the Nazis in order to survive. I can still say that I think all of his political perspectives are sheer garbage. And it doesn't mean that I'm criticizing George Soros' experiences in the Holocaust. Now, I think if you actually uh, live through the Holocaust, you might have a certain insight into uh, the rise of fascism, to what happens to victims of that fascism, to what can happen to families during that uh, time. But Ben Shapiro wants to uh, straw man that just a little bit more. And then, to put a little cherry on top of that, he continues the lie that George Soros was a collaborator. George Soros, and I don't care about George Soros' reputation, but it's just pointing out the lie that is Ben Shapiro. 
I mean, as I, he winds up to talk about, I'm only going to talk about facts. Let me just casually drop in this total lie. George Soros was 14 years old at the end, at the end of World War II. At one point, he was being protected by some type of local Hungarian official who was charged with going up to a wealthy Jew's estate who apparently had been rounded up at that point and taking an inventory. And he brought Soros with him because he was protecting him and hiding him from the Nazis. So basically and Soros she- was there, part of that inventory, presumably. And so this is metastasized into George Soros was a collaborator and the guy who is criticizing students for just being victims of gun violence and not having faxes sort of casually puts that out there as a lie. Well, and it really makes you rewatch Schindler's list. Yeah, exactly. All of, these All of those collaborators. collaborators with Schindler. Indeed. All right. Well, here is uh, Ben Shira, uh, Shapiro's uh, point. The breaking down the facts that uh, were apparently uh, problematic in David Hogg's speech. Approximately 200,000 people showed up in the March for Our Lives. It's a good number. It's a solid number. Okay, the March for Life in 2012 had 650,000 people who showed up to it. Was the media coverage blanket the way that it was on Saturday? Now, pause it. A- now, uh, I would bet just about anything that he is not comparing apples to apples there. 200,000 was a private uh, organization's assessment. The organizers said 800,000. I would bet on the anti-abortion rallies that he's talking about. We have a similar dynamic. But go ahead. I don't think that this is about the kids at Parkland. Kids are kids. Some of them say smart things. Some of them say dumb things. And just because some tragedy fell upon them doesn't mean that they suddenly have expertise on guns, for example. But the, the, the main issue here is why the media have decided to highlight and spotlight these kids. And the reason is because the kids can say things that the media can hide behind. The the high school kids who don't really know much about guns, don't know much about gun control, but can speak with passion and verve and are attractive on camera, they can say things that the media want to say, but know that they would be bashed about the ears for saying because they are supposed to be objective. And so what the media do instead is they put all of these kids on camera for hours at a time and then claim that if you criticize what these kids are saying, they're actually criticizing the the experiences of these kids. This is another form of identity politics. So identity politics is this idiotic concept from the left that suggests that we can identify the quality of your perspective simply by the color of your skin or your ethnicity or your age or something. All right, pause it for one second. All right, let me just add, I don't know who he's talking to. He's literally talking down on the desk and sort of like looking at the camera with one eye. But that's not what identity politics are at all. And I'm not defending identity politics, but that's not what identity politics are. Identity politics, when we talk about identity politics, you think, can't identify the quality of an argument based upon the color of your skin. That's not what identity politics are. Identity politics are when a certain group votes based on the attributes of that group. And they think that it's going to be representative of them to vote for someone who reflects those attributes. Yeah, actually, Ben, I think you've got that confused with uh, standpoint epistemology. Okay, (laughs) there you go. So, for instance, you might say, like, I'm a white guy. I'm just going to vote for the white guy. That would be identity politics. That would certainly be identity or politics. Or perhaps, fact, that like... that is the original identity politics in the sense that he's using it. Yes, of course. Yeah. Continue. All right, this is later now when he finally, after like eight minutes, gets to his critique of, uh, of this uh, high school student who he really, really, really has a problem with. And two, Republicans are actually going to show up in broader numbers thanks to this sort of demagoguery than they would otherwise. Okay, we can continue. Oh, pause it. Okay, okay. So he's now trying to take down David Hoag's um, argument that more people are going to come out and vote against uh, Donald Trump because of this stuff or against Republicans. Um, He has... um, Shapiro has some uh, argument that that's not the case. Actually, this demagoguery is going to motivate people to come and vote. I don't know where he has the data from that. Um, There is a poll that just came out um, uh, today that shows that um, 
only 32 percent of people uh, who are voting, uh, who are Trump voters, are excited to vote. There are 68 percent of people who are uh, excited to vote to vote against Trump and the Republicans. But oh. uh, uh, people who say they're most eager to vote strongly disapprove of Trump in a new poll. All right. But whatever. Go ahead. 96 people die every day from guns in our country, yet most representatives have no public stance. OK, on pause guns. it for one second. Okay, First of all, 96 people die in our country every day. 66 of those people die from suicide. OK, two thirds of all the people who are pause it. In, in other words, 66 people die from shooting themselves, which is in no way contrary to David Hogue's point. But continue. Every day, 66 of those people die from suicide. Okay, two thirds of all the people who are lumped into the gun violence statistics are suicides. Second of all, the vast majority Pause it. of people. Now, uh, here's something I want to explain. When you take a gun and you shoot yourself in the head or you shoot yourself in the mouth, that is a very violent uh, act. That would be gun violence. And in fact, if I decide to shoot myself with a gun, like this, I'm going to die. If I decide I'm going to kill myself with uh, a scissors or by taking too many pills or whatever, my chances of dying are much less, actually. And uh, a lot of those people go on to actually continue to live their lives, get some help, uh, things turn around. People who are killed with guns in the United States are killed with handguns. The proposals that have been pushed by March for Our Lives students have nothing to do with handguns. They have to do with AR-15s and so-called assault rifles. Okay, so none of this makes any sense on a policy level. Pause Continue. it. On a policy level, uh, let's be clear here that um, uh, we do we pass laws all the time that are not geared towards uh, solving every single problem in society. In fact, we have a whole host of financial laws that don't apply to every single possible financial crime malfeasance that could be taken place if it's like i don't even what is the analogy why are why, we, why, why are, are we outlying shoplifting, shoplifting when it doesn't in any way impact embezzlement that's actually a question i would seriously <laughs> continue it's a misappropriated tonight, we say no more we are going to make this the voting issue we're going to make, take this to every election, to every state, and every city. We're going to make sure the best people get in our elections to run, not as politicians, but as Americans. Because this, this is not cutting it. When people try to suppress your vote, and there are people who stand against you because you're too young, we say no more. When politicians say that your voice doesn't matter because the NRA owns them, we say no more. Okay, so we can stop it there. I don't need to listen to the rest of this. Okay, so first of all, the, the yelling and the screaming. I, I know there are a lot of young kids who think that when they do this, that this is actually just showing passion on the podium. Uh, it doesn't. It just, it's, it's, it's not convincing. It doesn't make people like you. It doesn't make people rally behind you. That was a speech code. Let me just point out what's going on here. Uh, ben Shapiro, who is sort of looking into camera uh, and uh, not quite centered in camera, just uh, looking like this, is giving tips on how to excite people. <laughs> I just want to point that out. Well, and now, also, we're watching one of like a and I will say this because this is impressive because I know back when I was in show business, you would look for something like this where how can I put someone who has that quality where you could put them in a room alone, right? Just alone. No, no, nothing particularly threatening them. Nothing, nothing happening in the room. Shoot them and, get, and, and develop tension and uncomfortability. And he's got it. He's definitely this is got a guy it. who you could just sit here and watch him drink a cup of coffee and feel uncomfortable because you could feel how uncomfortable he is in his own skin. Well, let me also just add here, though, and I know you're going to get to it, but I mean, there's a, there's some sophistry going on here, and he's moving the goalposts from a rational critique of policy to now a media critique of presentation. That is the problem. Fallacy, is logical, fa fallacy logical, logical fallacy, fallacy, logical fallacy, uh, logical fallacy, ad hominem, this logical is a fallacy. That's classic move by the um, uh, the conservatives. 
Republicans, uh, when they don't have the policy recommendations to talk about, they talk about the form over substance. And so uh, that is what we see here happening. Yeah, but they say it really fast, so they sound smart. I'm going to say it very quickly, and I'm going to look down at uh, uh, sideways into the camera. Logical fallacy. Logical fallacy. Logical fallacy. It's not convincing. It doesn't no, make people I, like you. It doesn't make people rally behind you. No, people don't In fact, like calmness and reason actually make people rally yes, behind people you people much than, prefer calmness and reason from the podium. From the podium. And this whole I'm thing fully that the NRA that. owns politicians, it's just not true. But it's absolutely not I true. I guess that that's not the point. The point here that's is, of point. course, to demagogue the issue as much as humanly possible. It wasn't just David Hogg who did this. At the end of it, he, he gave sort of a, a revolution symbol. Uh, the, the person who did this the best, actually, I will say, Emma Gonzalez is the most skilled politician. Let, let me uh, let me let me uh, pretend that I am giving a, a rational critique by uh, throwing a bone uh, to uh, one of the other uh, students there. And so I I I, I just I, I I think I've made my point uh, over and over again, which is uh, uh, them bad, me good. So, okay, uh, what happens next? <laughs> Man. That guy has really got down. He he has really perfected the I'm so uncomfortable in my skin, I can barely breathe. Uh, yeah, that is called presentation. That's right, presentation. Yeah, presentation. but it's also called this country cannot distinguish between sh- sophistry and actual thought. I mean, this guy, the cool kids philosopher in the New York Times, <laughs> this guy. Wow. Most trollsome title yet from them for anything.